This episode of Real Engineering is presented to you by Hover. Get 10% off your next domain purchase using the code Real Engineering. We are often told how loud supersonic booms are, but rarely actually get the chance to hear it for ourselves. One of the rare times where a boom was heard in an American city occurred in 2010 when a small float plane entered restricted airspace over Seattle when former President Barack Obama was visiting. Twin F-15 Eagles were scrambled to intercept the float plane and in the process broke the sound barrier over the greater Seattle area. The low-flying aircraft created a boom strong enough to shake homes and was heard as far as South Washington State and caused a huge surge in calls into local emergency services centres. This phenomenon of sonic booms is one of the key limiting factors that cause the Concorde to be an economic failure, but high-flying aircraft don't create near as loud booms as the sound energy is dissipated as it travels through the air. The other limiting factor preventing the Concorde from achieving economic success was its fuel economy. When comparing it to one of its major competitors, the Boeing 747, it consumed 50% more fuel, carried a quarter the amount of passengers, and had about half the maximum range. The range was so poor the plane was basically limited to transatlantic flights, as it couldn't cross the Pacific Ocean was banned from flying over land, as a result of those pesky sonic booms. Although the entire plane was treated like first class, flight tickets were still very high compared to competitor first class offerings, and it was difficult to find enough people to pay those prices regularly. Although the Concorde was, for all intents and purposes, a safe and successful aircraft for the entirety of its 27 year career, there were more than a handful of reasons the aircraft was officially retired in 2003. Growing pressure from the British and French governments, concerns about fuel costs, the lack of route options, and the simple shortage of mass market potential simply killed this iconic aircraft. For the next generation of supersonic aircraft to succeed, they're going to have to overcome these challenges, and this is exactly what Boom Technology plans to do. Boom is a startup company aiming to create a 45 passenger civilian supersonic transport aircraft to fly up to Mach 2.2 at a price comparable to a business class ticket on a regular airline. The laws concerning supersonic flight over land are still in place, so their plans are currently focusing on creating economically viable transoceanic flights like a London to New York flight that will take just 3 hours 15 minutes with a price of $2,500, a San Francisco to Tokyo flight that will take just 5 and a half hours and cost $3,250 each way, or an LA to Sydney route with a flight time of 6 hours and 45 minutes at $3,500 each way. These are still extremely expensive flights, but they open up the possibility of getting an early morning flight in LA arrive in Tokyo for a business meeting over sushi, and being back in time to tuck your kids into bed. Time is money for many people. Boom are currently developing two aircraft, an all premium class airliner and a geometrically similar two-seater jet called the XB-1. The XB-1 will be a one-third scale demonstration aircraft intended to be a testbed and proof of concept for the larger airliner. The team don't just have the advantage of hindsight guiding their design. When the Concorde was being developed, computers weren't really used for design work. Everything was done on paper and tested in wind tunnels. Today, the engineers at Boom have incredible design software allowing them to quickly develop prototype designs and have powerful computational analysis software that can test the design the same day without pouring money into building a scaled prototype and paying for wind tunnel hours. This allows them to tweak the design to the finest detail to create the most efficient aircraft possible. What once took days and thousands of dollars to test, takes a single engineer a couple of hours. This coupled with carbon fibre reinforced plastics is allowing the design of the Boom supersonic airliner to be lightweight, be perfectly shaped and perform well at the high temperatures of supersonic flight. So beyond these advantages, what are the differences between the Concorde and Boom? Boom believe that a 30% increase in fuel efficiency would reduce operating costs sufficiently to allow a viable business model. The Concorde consumed 16.7 litres of fuel every 100 kilometres per passenger, but the Concorde had an average passenger capacity of about 100, with 25 rows with 4 seats in each. Boom planned to have just 45 passengers, each getting their own window seat and aisle access, creating a much more enjoyable experience over the cramped interior of the Concorde, but it also makes that target of a 30% decrease in fuel consumption per passenger much more difficult. Let's look at some of the design features they are introducing to achieve this goal. Both planes feature an extremely thin delta wing, named after the triangular Greek letter delta. This design feature is essential to allowing the wing to function at both subsonic and supersonic speeds. 
If you watch my video about why plane wings are angled backwards, you will understand why sweeping the wing is incredibly important for planes that travel close to the speed of sound, but it's important for planes breaking the speed of sound too. As an object approaches the speed of sound, it experiences a sharp increase in coefficient of drag. And as explained in my greatest innovations in Formula 1 video, the drag force on an object increases with the square of the velocity. So creating a streamlined aircraft is incredibly important for supersonic aircraft, especially when fuel efficiency is paramount. Intuitively, we want to minimize the cross-sectional area of the aircraft to reduce the drag but we also want to minimize the changes in cross-sectional area along the length of the plane to reduce wave drag. Wave drag is a form of drag that arises as a result of shock waves. If we compare two shapes with the same maximum cross-sectional area, but one is smoothed and the other has a sudden change in cross-sectional area, we can see the latter has a much higher coefficient of drag as it enters supersonic speed. This is something the designers of Boom have clearly taken into account as they've narrowed the fuselage where it meets the wing as the wing increases the cross-sectional area of the plane in that location. Concorde did not do this as it added too much to manufacturing costs at the time. This is called the area rule and I'll be exploring it in detail in a future video. Sweeping the wing backwards decreases the coefficient of drag significantly at transonic and supersonic speeds too, and the delta wing of boom has a greater sweep angle than the Concorde at 70 degrees versus the Concorde's 55. The delta wing helps both planes maintain a thin aerodynamic wing thanks to the short wingspan and long cord, reducing the structural load on the wing compared to the long wingspan and short cord of a conventional plane. The delta wing performs well at low speeds too, as a result of unique swirling vortices that form on the upper surface of the wing. On a traditional aircraft's wing, a swirling vortex is formed only at the wing tips. On a delta wing, they form on nearly the entire wing surface and produces a considerable amount of lift. This is particularly apparent on damp days where the vortices can be seen forming on the upper surface of the wing due to the water vapour condensing in the low pressure vortex. The delta wing gains additional lift, particularly on landing, as a result of the ground effect where the downwash of the air between the wing and the ground creates a cushion of air. But generating lift using these techniques needs a large angle of attack, and the Concorde's angle of attack on landing was so high that the nose of the plane needed to be tilted downwards to allow the pilots to see what they were doing. I imagine Boom are just employing a camera to help the pilots see on landing. Boom also uses a chined fuselage, which helps maintain the centre of lift as the plane gains speed. As a supersonic plane gains speed, the centre of lift tends to move backwards, creating issues for balance and control of the aircraft. A chine is a ridge that extends from the wing. You can see a similar shape on the SR-71. This structure generates more lift at supersonic speeds than subsonic speeds and thus helps hold the center of lift location. The engines may be the most interesting part of the design with variable geometry inlets. At supersonic speed, the air is efficiently slowed down to the ideal subsonic speed for the engine with digitally controlled movable surfaces precisely shaping shockwaves to achieve ideal compression at a range of speeds and flight conditions. The Concorde used turbojet engines, which were superior for supersonic flight over turbofan engines, as they have a much smaller frontal area, reducing drag. The Russian supersonic jet airliner, the TU-144, initially used turbofan engines, but later changed to turbojet and gained a significant increase in efficiency. But today's engines are much more efficient and Boom can reach their performance targets with a medium bypass turbofan engine, which also reduces the noise on takeoff and landing, an important trait to allow the plane to land in many airports. Boom isn't just some concept plane like the Aurora D8 shown previously, it is an actual plane in development and the company closed a $33 million round of investment last March. If the flight test of the one third scale XB1 next year proves successful, we could be in for a re-emergence of civilian supersonic flight in the near future. Thanks for watching. So last week I spoke about why Hover is such a great place to purchase domains, but this week I'm going to show you. In the time this message takes, I'll have bought myself a new domain. This footage is not sped up and it's uncut, including all the waiting time with my crappy Malaysian internet. So here I am purchasing the domain. No extra fees and who is privacy is included for free, so no one can find out your personal information. And speaking of hiding personal information, the video will be blurred for a little while. Okay, while I struggle to sign in, I'll give you another reason to use Hover, their customer support. Call them and an actual person will answer, no annoying phone trees or getting transferred around, or you can email them if you're antisocial like me. 
Right, so we are ready to submit this order. Another little while while my internet loads and there we go, the domain is mine. Quick and easy. If that sounds appealing, you can get 10% off your next purchase using the code REALENGINEERING at checkout. Don't forget to use it like I did. While I have you here, I want to make an announcement. Some of you may have heard already, but I started a podcast called Showmakers with Sam from Wendover Productions. We've interviewed some incredible people already like Hank Green and Destin Sandlin and Mike Hurley. If you want to check it out, the links are in the description and probably in the top comment in the comment section. And as always, thank you to all my Patreon supporters and you for watching this video. If you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram or anything like that, the links are in the description as well.